Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida. And I'm here today with my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. So we are both from, and while well, I'm not really from Hernando County, I'm in Hernando County. I live in Hernando County now. Yes. So I've lived welcome, in, welcome everybody. I've lived in Hernando County since 1978. And I know if I have a question about the county or the people or who to contact to do this or that. I even told Teresa the other day, we, she got a phone call from somebody who said, there's water coming up in her yard. And I said, well, we can't help with that. I told her to tell the lady to contact John Burnett with Hernando mm -hmm. County. But I said, if you ever have a question about who to contact about anything with the county, get a hold of Lily. She knows everybody. I've also worked for Hernando County for 22 years. Yeah, so I usually can point you in the right direction. Um, yeah, there was a, I actually had a question from one of the um, workers downstairs in customer service. She had someone on the line. Now I'm trying to remember exactly what the question was but it wasn't anything we could have helped them with they were afraid something you know to do with their septic and well water and flooding and things like that and they you know this customer service person um didn't know who to send them to and i suggested environmental health at the health department and she said she never would have thought of that and that's just part of that um you know, that old institutional knowledge that they <laughs> talk about, yeah. Well, unfortunately, some of the people with the county, if they get a phone call, they don't know the right. answer. They just patch them through to extension. <laughs> Teresa spoke with a gentleman yesterday who called to complain because he was out riding his bike and there was a pallet in the road with nails sticking out of it. We don't normally deal with that. No. We don't have the extension truck to run over there and pick up the pallet. And so she did give him the phone number for DPW. Right. I, I guess that would be the best people to contact. Yes, that would be who you contact. And it also then depends on um, what road. I mean, if it was on 41, 1998 uh, or 50, then the Department of Public Works in the county would either give you the phone number or contact the Florida um, Department of Transportation themselves because those are state roads. <laughs> See, I do. <laughs> I you really do know everything, don't you? We're just going to keep you on speed. We're just going to direct all those calls to you because you can direct them to who they should talk to much better than we can. 12 years at County Extension doing Teresa's job. Mm -hmm. um, about three years at the Department of Public Works. <laughs> And then the last seven doing this job. So hope to finish out with this job. That will be that will be great. <laughs> and good morning, Lee. Us here at Extension, we can answer lawn and garden questions, problems and questions that you might have with insects, plant diseases. I can't help a whole lot with pallets in the middle of the street. They think extension. They misinterpret that word. They think you're like a um, clearinghouse, you know, to be able to, you know, um, extend them to the next county department or something, which I know in Pasco County, and I think this is a fantastic idea. Of course, you have to consider Pasco County is much bigger than we are, but they do have basically a call-in center like a clearinghouse. I, I'm friends with the lady who helps manage it. And basically you call one number and the people in there then know where to send, you know, or you tell them what your issue is and they know where to send it out to. So, but we're, we're kind of small. <laughs> so you have to rely on uh, people like me who've been here a long time and know where to, send, know where to I know where to tell you where to go. <laughs> As do we. 
Mm -hmm. And Jane says that Lily pointing someone in the right direction is a blessing. Thank you. So mm -hmm. I know I've gotten some unusual calls. I got a call from a gentleman. I answered the phone. He said, just want to let you know that I'm all done putting my new roof on. You can come out and inspect it whenever you want. Cool. Go ahead. <laughs> well, that's great. Congratulations. But I'm probably not the one to come out and inspect it. Uh, you that's the building out. department. Building department, building permits, and have them come out and look at it. Yes. They know what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And it probably was on their paperwork. But, you know, they may have looked at the address in that situation, and the building department is located where extension once was. So that's where that okay that issue came in oh we have a question here from akisha which i can't answer because even though i am a doctor i'm not that kind of doctor <laughs> not a medical so, doctor poor akisha got bitten by a stray kitten last september and she was vaccinated against rabies two months ago do i need to be vaccinated again you need to go talk to your medical doctor about right. that or the health department, wherever it was that you got the vaccination, ask them, yeah. Exactly, the health department could probably help you, but they will most likely tell you to go to your primary care physician and ask them because they can give you better information on that than I ever could. Mm -hmm. I am a doctor of plant medicine. Well, so. speaking of that, why don't you bring my sick plant up? Okay, yeah, Lily's got uh, some pictures here. Let me go ahead and... Okay, hopefully you can see that okay. It's a flower. It's a pretty purple flower. Zinnia. What happened to some of the petals? I don't know. <laughs> but the next picture is even more uh, telling. I think something had them for lunch. <sighs> oh my goodness, I see a stem. Yes. And it looks well, like see, there were leaves on it, but the leaves are gone because something ate them. This was, I told you, I think I told you, these were zinnias, my surprise zinnias. And I think at some point, because you get um, packets of seeds that, you know, especially during COVID, um, we didn't really have time or opportunity to disperse them. So they, they become expired and all that. So I had a packet and I probably threw this packet in my front bed, my butterfly garden. Only thing that's ever come up that I've done that with are these zinnias. Because when they started coming up, I was looking at them like, hello, I didn't plant you. But so I'm very happy with them. And there's actually quite a few growing. But yet yesterday I saw that something is enjoying them for lunch or dinner or <laughs> something. So I thought, I know someone who can uh, help me figure out this problem. Yes, that's a very common problem. If you see chewed up leaves, if you start turning over leaves and looking very carefully, a lot of times you'll find caterpillars that are feeding on it. There are some caterpillars, mostly cutworms, that mostly come out at night. So if you're out there looking during the day, you're turning over at least. It's like, I know I have caterpillars, but I can't find them. Where are they? They hide during the day in the mulch and come out at night and feed on your plants. And you can also have, um, there's a number of different beetles that feed on plant leaves also. We have leaf beetles. We have um, a couple others that can be pests. They tend to notch leaves. So if you look at a leaf, let me get in front of the camera here, and there's just a notch missing out of it, mm -hmm. a lot of times that's a beetle. Once again, if you start looking really, really close and turning over leaves and examining the plant very closely, a lot of times you'll find one of the beetles is causing the damage. So should I do anything about it or just? If you could find the caterpillars, you could do what I do and just throw them over the fence. <laughs> Serious, I pick them off and I throw them over the fence, problem solved. I am so glad I am not your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can use BT 
or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a yeah, no, good no, no, control. Nope. nope, it's or in a butterfly that. garden. But you got to go and grab the sprayer and mix it up and fill it up and pump it up. That's a lot of work. Yep. No, this is a butterfly garden. And so. I, you can very easily just pick it off and throw it over the fence and be done in just a few seconds. Very, very quick, very easy. Oh, Lee found Buddy, Buddy ate said my he plant. did it. I guess Buddy said um, he threw his caterpillars over the fence. No, I don't know. I think, he said that. I think he said that before. I think he may have eaten my plants. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Oh, you saw caterpillars but, munching but away yes, last night. There are caterpillars and there are beetles that can come out only at night. So if you keep checking your plants and you're thinking, something is chewing up the leaves and I can just never find who's doing it, try going out at night with a flashlight and taking a look. Sometimes you catch them then. All right. But also I know a lot of people, um, Alice Smith, your master gardener who... Um, the expert on natives and those zinnias aren't natives but um she basically says that you know if your yard isn't being eaten then it's not <laughs> a good ecosystem yeah um, so it's in a butterfly garden so i'll probably i mean i may physically remove them if i find them but i'm certainly not going to use bt that kills caterpillars in a butterfly garden <laughs> this is my pollinator garden and they were Surprise zinnias anyway, um, and there's a lot more, so hopefully they won't all get eaten up like this, but I'll keep an eye out. Yeah, because keep in mind anything that you have in a butterfly garden, if you spray for caterpillars, it's going to kill all the caterpillars, the ones that maybe you don't want, which are chewing up your zinnias, and it will kill the ones that you do want, like, for example, monarch butterfly caterpillars right. that might be feeding on your milkweed. Mm -hmm. So Kristen asks, my milkweed leaves are getting black spots. What could be causing that? Mind you. Let me tell everybody that right now it is, let me look in the corner, September 16th, which for people who are relatively new to Central Florida, we're getting very close to the end of summer. It's not fall yet. You know, I mean, you might be enjoying pumpkin drinks and pulling out the decorations. It's not quite fall yet. We're at the end of summer. And summers here are long and warm, and it stays hot during the day, warm at night. Humid. Rain a lot. Very hu high humidity day and night. Rains late in the day. Yesterday it rained. We got another big rain at our house right around dark. And all those conditions all add up to be absolutely perfect for growing fungal diseases. So this time of year, I know that we literally have a line of people come to the office and some of them will bring in a grocery store bag and they have 10 separate baggies and they pull one out. Here's some leaves off my viburnum, pull out another one. Here's a leaf off my cherry laurel, another one. Here's a leaf off my ligustrum, everything in our yard. And they all have spots because it's all fungal leaf spot. Everything in your yard almost everything in your yard is susceptible to some kind of fungal leaf spot and by the end of summer almost everything in your yard if you go out there and look really really close today you'll find a lot of spotted leaves out there mm -hmm. generally it's normal for anything that's got uh, that's going to drop its leaves in the not too distant future so like crepe myrtle your crepe yeah. myrtle loses all of its leaves in the winter there's no point spraying it for a fungus right now. The leaves are going to fall off pretty soon. Figs lose their leaves, and they always get um, they get rust, which is a type of fungus. Mm -hmm. Your um, and I got an email about this the other day uh, that my boss Jim Davis forwarded to me. A lady with plumerias. Everybody who has a plumeria. It's very, very common for it to get plumeria rust. And almost all of them, if they're growing outdoors, do by the end of summer. So you turn the leaf over, and if there's like these orange dots all over it, that's plumeria rust. Don't worry, because the leaves are going to fall off for the winter pretty soon anyway. Most of your hedges, your viburnum, ligustrums, boxwoods, things like that, you don't need to spray them for fungal leaf spots. 
it's generally going to go away once the weather turns into fall weather. Oh my gosh, my email is blowing up here. Um, and the weather cools off, it stops raining as much, and the humidity starts to drop a little bit. But Kristen, your milkweed leaves are probably getting black spots from a little touch of a fungal leaf spot disease. Probably nothing to worry about. Your milkweeds are going to either be losing its leaves soon or you need to cut it back to the ground. And if you have tropical milkweed, when do you cut that back? Well, that's just what I was going to say. If you have native milkweeds, they are, um, you know, going down for the season. Mine are seeding. So they're getting all that fluffy, you know, seed pods and spreading mm -hmm. around. But they're going to save gonna... seeds. Mm -hmm. Save those seeds. Save those seeds. Um, work. <laughs> um, so they are, you know, just going down because it's the season too. If you have tropical milkweed, um, they're not going to go down like the natives will, and that becomes a problem. Um, Kristen, I'm not sure where you are, but here in Central Florida and in North Florida, our tropical milkweed, uh, Sclepius cursa, uh, no, yeah, cursivaca. Um, it doesn't go down for the winter, so it tricks the monarchs to staying around longer, and then it's too cold for them. If we have a freeze, the monarchs freeze to death, or there's so many other things that can happen um or they hang around and you know they lay eggs and then they hatch and maybe it's warm but there's nothing to nectar on because you know their regular uh plants that they would nectar on aren't around because it's january or february the picture on the left that bill's shown is tropical milkweed um persibaca the one on the right is a tuberosa, a native milkweed. My native milkweeds, they're blooming still, but they're, they're looking kind of sad in their leaves. But if you have this tropical milkweed, it's going to want to keep blooming all through. So we suggest, I would say end of October, um, cut them back. Even if they want to keep growing, keep them cut back till uh, mid-March or so um, just so we can avoid the monarchs freezing to death and, and not um, migrating on to the warmer climates where they should be like maybe in the Keys or Mexico or something like that. There are other issues. That's not the only issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they carry a parasite naturally um, called OA. Is that what we, yeah, yeah. we can't. It's, you a, might be it's a parasite. It's a single cell organism. Right, and all the monarchs have it just naturally. But what have we learned in the past year and a half about social distancing? OE, thank you, Kristen, <laughs> about social distancing. We've learned the importance of that. Well, if we trick these monarchs into staying around where they shouldn't be, they are not uh, social distancing and that parasite can spread you know, in unnatural ways. It doesn't really hurt the adults, but it can kill the caterpillars. So <laughs> the moral of the story is you are just so much better off um, sticking with the native milkweeds, even though they're a little hard to find, than running to your big box store and getting the tropical milkweed. Um, and the fourth thing is now they're finding out they are showing invasive tendencies. So <laughs> like, Every few months, I hear another negative thing to say about the tropical milkweed. So yeah, and the native ones are difficult to find at stores. You really have to look for a native plant nursery and hope that they have some in stock. They are working towards, you know, as more people ask for them and want them, they'll grow more to sell to you. Sure. It's just taking a little time. The native ones apparently are difficult to propagate and get to grow. Right. There's 21 native uh milkweeds in florida and only three have they had good success to be available commercially that tuberosa that you showed that was great for high and dry areas like i have sandy sand hills there are two other swamp milkweeds uh, perennis and incarnata perennis is white <clears throat> incarnata is pink those are the three 
uh, most common commercially available that you'll find from native plant people, native plant sales, native plant nurseries, uh, Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery. Um, those are the most available. They are working on, you know, it's kind of a mixture of you need a market, you need it available, but you need a market, but you need it available. But also um, supply and demand. Right, supply and demand, and also making them, uh, finding ways to make them transportable, <laughs> you know, and and able to propagate them well. They're working on about maybe two others um, right now that should be. But some grow fabulously in the wild. They're, a lot of these wild things are hard to tame, and that's what it, you know, boils down to. So... Moral of the story, find, go to the Master Gardener Nursery or find one of those three natives I mentioned. Uh, the tuberosa is that orange one he showed called butterfly weed a lot, incarnata and perennis. So, and if you don't remember that, you can email me and I can uh, send you those. Yeah, and remember there are a lot of different nurseries and businesses online. We don't recommend any ones in particular. Uh, you always want to look, you know, of course, check reviews and everything else. But there are a lot of options nowadays, whereas, you know, in years gone by, you were kind of limited to whatever nurseries were in your town or within a reasonable driving distance now. You still want to be careful, though, to... Think Amazon. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what is native... You know the exact same kind of plant uh a native black eye susan in indiana isn't the same ecotype of native black eye susan in florida so you need to be careful of that um you can make a day trip and find the different um nurseries as long as you stay in central florida go to you know towards orlando there's all those feeder nurseries that feed the big mouse over there and there's several native ones um, also, floridawildflowers.com. They don't give exclusively just native uh, wildflowers, but that's a good place to go to find seeds as well. But just be careful, even with mon or monarchs, yes, even with milkweeds, what is native to Minnesota, you know, someplace like that is not the same ecotype that grows here in Florida. Kind of like shopping at the grocery store. You want to make a list and know what you're looking for first before you go to the store and just start tossing stuff in your cart. Oh, no. You go to the nursery and buy what's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> this one's flowering. It looks so beautiful. Yes. I, 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 I'm sure because they have it for sale, it's going to grow well in my yard. Well, maybe and maybe not. <laughs> I, I, I know I, a couple of years ago, they are really pushing foxtail palms. In Central Florida, and they are beautiful palms in they Miami. <laughs> they get big and they get beautiful, um, and the the leaves are. It does look a little bit like a fox's tail. It's kind of fluffy and twists a little bit. Yeah, I've seen them on the East Coast. Yeah. Boy, when it gets down to below thirty two degrees, they die really fast. And what happens pretty much every winter here in Hernando County? You get at least one. For at least one night. Yeah, so. one two. One to five freezes, probably. Yeah, so we don't see many live ones here. Now, people can push it a little bit. Technically, we're too cold to really grow bananas here, but plenty of people do. Papayas, if you keep them warm, put them in a warm spot in your yard, they can do well. Just know um, you're experimenting. Bismarck palms, which technically we're too far north for them. I know of several in a subdivision right next to my neighborhood and they're beautiful that's my favorite palm and boy they get huge down in south florida too the trunks i mean you know really really big around and they can do well here i know of a few they lose a few leaves every winter if we get a lot of cold but they're old enough and established and they must but just be in the right spot but we haven't had a cold 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 winter in a long time more than a dozen years probably <clears throat> we've seen 15 degrees here in hernando county if that happens again if that cycles around you're gonna lose a lot of those palms 
Yeah, if you have a way to keep it warm, if it's in a warm spot in your yard, a little microclimate. I mean, it's a gamble, but for some people it works and works well. And when you say keep it warm, you mean 33. You don't mean 72. You don't have to create a sauna for for that. And many of these things, depending on how large and how old and how established they are, can take temperatures a little bit below 32. So don't think that 32 is this magical necessarily cutoff. Mangoes become very unhappy and quit growing and start to look not really great at above 32, uh, depending on the variety. There are varieties of avocados. I just made a Facebook post for today on that that will take it down below 32, but they do have a lower limit. It also depends on how the weather was and if they have become acclimatized. Uh -huh. If it was slowly getting cooler, you know, then the, uh, now you're getting phone calls. Then the, I know. <laughs> then the trees, the plants have, they become adjusted and they acclimatize to it. It, but what is more than likely in Florida is it's going to be 85 one day and 22 the next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that makes it harder on the plants. Because I know with citrus, and even though we have a lot less citrus because of citrus greening, in the past, an older mature tree can take temperatures colder than a brand new small young tree. So a lot factors into it. There is no, and I can't tell you a magical, if the temperature at the Brooksville airport hits, you know, 32, it will die. If it doesn't, it will do fine. It's really, really hard to say. A lot goes into it. Yep. I like to tell a lot of people, well, it depends. Kind of depends. So are any of those emails where they, was anyone asking you questions in your email? Oh, um, no. Okay. <laughs> no. Here, what, you want me to check my email? <laughs> <laughs> Just to see um, if any questions come through. No, I'm getting Facebook notifications and okay. pesticide exam information and mm -hmm. Kristen has a question about her lime tree. Okay. Kristen says her lime tree leaves are curling. Is this that bad parasite or could the pot be too small? How can I tell? Curling citru citrus leaves can curl a lot. It's a pretty common thing. If it's growing in a pot and the pot's too small, that'll do it. Um, certain times of the year it'll curl a little bit curling and twisting can indicate insects feeding on it so asian citrus psyllids which are the really bad ones that spread citrus greening when they feed on the brand new leaves and they like the little tiny leaves that are just starting to come out when they feed on them they make them twist and curl when they grow in if your leaves on your citrus are curling and it looks like there's an old notch take, taken out of it. Like when the tree made that leaf, it missed a notch in it. That's very bad. That's a sign of cit uh, citrus psyllid feeding. Because when it feeds on the tiny little leaf, when it grows, it's going to grow with a notch missing out of it that the psyllid caused when it was really small and not out yet. So leaves curling can be caused by a lot of different things, but a lot of times it's nothing. So it depends. <laughs> you like that, don't you? Yeah. Well, you know what my favorite answer is? I don't know. Yeah. I'll figure it out. I'll look it up. Uh, I'll email Lily and ask her, or I can't remember the name of that plant or all the varieties of milkweed or whatever it might be. I'll figure it out, but I don't know right off the top of my head. What your master gardener, Bernie, who's across the building from you there, I'm doing the real life plant clinic, but he always says about citrus, he loves citrus because either, 
number one, it's going to fix itself or it isn't. <laughs> there isn't any in between. <laughs> Citrus, because there are so many different things that could be affecting it, along with greening, there's a whole bunch of different fungi. There are insects named after citrus, which is always a bad sign. Citrus whiteflies, citrus scales, citrus this and that. Gets a little tricky. Trees are easy. Trees are either, it's not a problem, just leave it alone, or... Your tree's either dead or going to die, and there's nothing you do about it. So the you're really limited to what the answers or diagnosis can be. So trees are pretty easy. Yeah. But um, if you, Kristen, if you'd like to call the office, you can speak to our master gardener Bernie. You can email or text um, pictures of your lime tree to Teresa. She's the one who's going to answer the phone. So let's start sending phone calls to Teresa. <laughs> There's our phone number, 352-754-4433. Or you can email pictures directly to me. And either, you know, if you send them pretty quick, we can catch them this morning. Or I'll email back and tell you what I believe it is. Um, and Kristen, what county are you in? I think you said earlier you're on the East Coast, so probably not Hernando County. We're pretty much West Coast. So let me know what county you're in, because that does make a difference. But you, if you guys have questions, you can always email them to me. You can email all your really difficult questions to Lily, because she likes to research them and figure out what the answers are. Or just forward them to me, and that's what she does. I do like that. <laughs> I don't have as much time as I used to anymore. So every so often, when I'm doing a whole lot of stuff and a question comes my way, I'll be like, Teresa, can, can you get a master gardener to spend the time <laughs> to answer this question? So. The really, really simple ones and questions about soil tests and things like that. Yeah, I am able to just forward those to master gardeners or Teresa to handle. I need to quit doing that. Mm -hmm. she's, she's busy also. So, And yeah, Kristen was hoping that the problem is just that the tree has outgrown the pot. And that can happen. That'll do it. She's in Brevard County, so she will have oh, okay. better luck with a lime tree than we would up here in general. You know, we have quite the following from Brevard County. Yeah. And I've never figured out why. I love Brevard County. Uh, you Mel guys, you can Melbourne just, Beach is one of my favorite uh, places. You can grow all the great tropical fruits. And even though it might not be you're real close to the ideal place to grow it i am going to get an experiment with growing a lychee tree in the backyard i need to get a mango but i'm not positive what variety to get yet i need to get something that's going to get tasty mangoes and still be fairly cold resistant bananas don't work out for me because bananas are little water hogs mm -hmm. and i'm in spring hill and i'm just too high and dry it, People I knew who had success with bananas um, planted by a lake. By a lake? I've seen them next to a creek or mm -hmm. just really, really wet area. We need to plant some at the nursery because half of the year it's a swamp over there. Bananas would probably do great there. So yeah. I'll grow my bananas at the nursery. There you go. Them, don't mess with that bunch of bananas. It's mine. <laughs> We'll see you have happens. a question from someone from Facebook about Plumbago. And sure, Austin. and Austin's here today. Good morning, Austin. Yeah. How are you? And we have uh, a lengthy question here from our Facebook group. Somebody has 30 feet of heavily flowering uh, Plumbago plus wildflowers edging all my fences. The back two and a half acres are left natural and the front yard gardens have flowering plants. That all sounds like a good plan. Lots of butterflies, I'm sure, especially this time of year, but mm -hmm. absolutely no bees. I live a few miles from Chinsiga and back up to the forest. Is this a trend all over? Last year I could hear my gardens buzzing. There were so many bees. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about honeybees, it really depends on if there's any near you or not. If there's any beekeepers 
or you know a lot of times they'll the hive will split and half of the hive will leave and now they live in a tree they live in the woods we have wild european honeybees all over the place but maybe there's just not many really close to you yeah i have a good amount of pollinators and and bees um all over my uh biden's alba <laughs> my uh, spanish needle and all over the different stages i have in the front so my um, fog fruit is oh my gosh there's so many butterflies flying around my lawn right now because they all fed on the fog fruit and hatched the little crescents and the larger um what's the white most peacock. white peacock white peacock yeah because they're both out because you know we're right at the very end of summer white pe peacocks seem to be the last butterfly that comes out in summer okay. it just seems that way mm -hmm. I haven't seen like a whole lot of butterflies, um, even though I have the milkweed, I really haven't seen any monarchs, but that doesn't mean they're not there. I'm not there during the day <laughs> a lot anymore. And um, I do see a lot of the yellow uh, butterflies. What are they? I just lost the name. You know, just the regular yellow <laughs> butterflies. Oh, sulfur? Sulfur, sulfur butterflies? Sulfur butterflies, thank you, yes. Especially around my fire bush and things like that. But it depends on what kind of host plants you have. Because my neighbors always had um, a lot of passion vine. And even though new people have bought the house and they've taken down a lot of stuff over there, there's still some passion vine. Oh, well, they're always with them. Zebra long wings. I have. I have a fire bush and I noticed five zebra long wings flying around it the other day. And they're all kind of flying around and they got closer and closer. They were flying as a group for a while around mm -hmm. the bush. I was kind of standing nice. there watching them like, are they doing that on purpose? Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, a nice, nice little pack of them moving around. I got little passion vine plants. And what I'm going to do the next time is grow them pretty big before I put them out. Because they're still there. I looked last night. They're about this big. What keeps happening with them is I believe it is my tortoises find them nice and yummy. <laughs> so they, yeah, yeah. They're not pulling them up. They just chew them right off and then it starts to try to grow again. So I have it near a fence, but they haven't gotten big enough to get on the fence yeah probably won't this year yet now but i'm hoping now next year they'll you know but that's what my yard is for to keep all those critters happy <laughs> you know if like we said if it's not feeding nature then really what is it for so. yeah and a funny thing with passion vine is it spreads underground very quickly okay well so maybe it's you plant one, to spread elsewhere if you plant one in your yard, you may come back a few weeks later and go, oh my gosh, it died. Just yeah. leave it. And the next spring, you know what? You may have like a couple of them pop up five yeah, right. feet away. Right. Same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. So just leave it. And even though that one may never come back, now you have a couple other ones that just start to pop up all over the place. And it's a spreader. I mean, expect it to be popping up in your lawn, in other parts of the flower bed, maybe where you don't want it, but that's just how it is. And if you can okay. keep it, keep it. What I would do about the question about the bees is um, since that's where she lives. And if you're, if you are um, writing in from Facebook, we only get to see Facebook users. So we apologize if we do know you, but we can't see <laughs> who you are. Yeah. No, what, um, what happens is if you're watching us through our Facebook group, it's a funny thing about Facebook groups. You have to give Facebook permission to show your name. Okay. So you should have a little um, well, sometimes it box shows pop later. up, especially mm -hmm. when you first go on. And you can click and tell Facebook, okay, you can use my name. Because we do have people that watch us on the group and their names show up. Other people, all we, Lily and I see is Facebook, Facebook users. User. Um, I would contact the Chinsigat Conservation Center, the new 
person running it there is Hannah. Hannah, <laughs> yeah. Help me with that. <laughs> Hannah. And um, ask them if they've noticed any decrease in bees. Yeah, so we buy Chinsega Conservation Center and say hi to Hannah and tell her that we sent you mm -hmm. and ask her how her bees are going because they have a lot of flowering plants, flowering weeds and everything over in the field areas. And I know normally they have a good population of native bees, every kind of different bee imaginable, along with European honeybees. Because I noticed um, when, when you watch this later on Facebook, their name actually shows up like in the comments, which we can't see here. So at one point, yeah, yeah, yeah. we were both talking to someone we know extremely well Donna from Silverthorne, <laughs> and we didn't realize it so, until later. So, okay, Monica has a question, and she has hibiscus in a courtyard because you get, she gets frost in her area. That's good. That's in a protected area. Um, they die back, and they didn't come back as nice, so we move them. They're constantly getting covered in aphids. Aphids are a really common pest on a huge variety of different plants. You get aphids on hibiscus and everything in your vegetable garden and every other kind of bush. So aphids are very widespread. We've used all kinds of sprays. Any advice short of throwing them away? You don't need to do that. Um, aphids are easy enough to deal with. I've always had the best luck with insecticidal soap. That's not the stuff you use to wash your dinner dishes with. That's the stuff that you go to either a nursery or a big box store or Amazon and order. It is potassium salts of fatty acids, I think, which is um, a byproduct from, I'm not even sure what it's a byproduct of. It is safe to use. You need to read the directions. You need to wear gloves. Don't drink it. Don't take a bath with it. Don't wash your dinner dishes with it. The label does not say to do that, but you can mix it up and spray your plants with it. And it's generally not phytotoxic to your plants. So it's not gonna hurt your plants. It kills, works very well on little tiny soft body things. So aphids, spider mites, mealybugs, white flies, some scales, soft body scales, which is about half of them. Works really well on all of them, but you're gonna to have to do it more than once. So read the label and it'll say that after you treat your plants, you could treat again within seven days, 14 days, whatever, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, it depends on what brand you buy. Read the label and you're gonna to have to spray more than once, but if you do that a couple times, you'll get the um, aphids under control because a healthy hibiscus can handle some Aphids, it just can't handle 10 million aphids. So if they build up, you may need to kind of knock them back and get them back in the line. Don't think that you have to keep going until you get, you know, 0, 0.0 aphids. Right, right. Because, you know, you'll have your uh, beneficials around. There's little wasps uh -huh. that uh, like them. Hibiscus, aside from being cold um, sensitive, are really actually pretty tough. I've seen them even come back from the roots, even if they were frozen all the way back. But then they also get a little picky. Uh, they start getting yellow leaves and it may be due to overwatering or it may be due to not enough water. <laughs> Those are the exact same symptoms. But in general, they're pretty tough. And see, Lily, really, our Facebook user is Linda, who's okay. a volunteer at Chinsiga. So she knows exactly who Hannah is. <laughs> okay. And she okay. sees me there all the time, knows, as knows. do I. Linda knows my friend Alice, who also works part-time at Chinsigit, and mm -hmm. they go out shooting pictures together. And so, they, uh, see, I told you I know all the connections. Exactly. You know everybody in this county. Thank you, Diana. And Cloud Diana says, salt. yes, it's cloudless sulfur. There's a bunch of different species of sulfur butterflies that live here in Hernando County. Mm -hmm. And Monica wants to know what's the, that secret to growing plumbagos. She really likes the plants. She's tried everything. I've never had a problem with it. 
I they, have. So I'll let you answer it because the ones I tried died. Oh, well, then why don't you answer it? Because I've never had a problem with it. They well, then have, I think you need to answer it. What, with a lot of plants, if you put them in the right spot and it's the right you know, location as far as light goes, soil, everything else, and they get settled in and they, they go, wow, we like it here. We're really happy. They'll grow like mm -hmm. weeds. Oh, yes. Um, Bougainvillea is a perfect example of that. Bougainvilleas can grow like huge weeds if they're really happy. Mm -hmm. If they're not, they'll die. Right. And well, that's think, all there is to it. I think my issue with the plumbago was this. I planted them immediately after we moved into our new house I, uh, along the backside of it along the screen porch. So what did I plant them in, Dr. Lester? I don't know. What did you plant about? Fill dirt. Just plain uh, sterile, nutrient-less fill dirt. And maybe, I don't know, the whole place is rather sunny, so I don't know if it was too shady there or not. But I think now that I'm learning more about soils and you touched on soils, when we move into a brand new house and we have that nutrient free <laughs> field dirt plus all the building materials they um, buried in there, it makes planting rather difficult. I have a lot better success planting things. I have a half an acre and they put down the house and bahia grass and a few shrubs in the first quarter acre. They left the back quarter acre totally alone, which I'm very glad for. So I have much better success when I plant things back there, even though you're gonna say with Florida, it's just sand, but it's our native sand. It's not drug in fill dirt that they brought from deep in the earth. We're still, I'm really thinking we're gonna have to do a class on that of how to re-naturalize these uh, plots of uh, fill dirt that they threw um, turf and stuff on top of, you know, how to try. And eventually, it's going to happen over time. But yeah. How, but how to over maybe, twenty or thirty years? Yeah. How to maybe help that process along? And really, the answer is organic matter. <laughs> that is the answer. But I think we need to cover that one. I think so. Yeah, and I think um, plumbagos may just like a slightly heavier, richer kind of soil. Because plumbagos are not natives. Right. If you're growing native plants, find native soil. That's what they like the best. They don't like really, most well, it depends on the native you're talking about. Natives don't like to be fertilized a lot. They don't need it. They don't want it. It, it surprises them and they usually don't do well. Plumbagos are not a native. That's a domesticated um, mm -hmm. ornamental plant. It may like slightly heavier soil. Could be. Now I have had for years um, dwarf yopon hollies in that location, and they're just as happy as can be. Yeah, because that's a native, and mm -hmm. they, they like that, just the sand and just the way it is. Just plunk them in, and they should do well. A lot of times you'll find your native wildflowers don't don't give them a really nice soil. They want the sandy area. If you're going to try and grow chick seed for black eye susans or um, gallardia uh, blanket flower, which okay, I know yes, it was kicked off the <laughs> native plant team, but it's still a hard flower. Yes, um, June sunflower despises rich soil. <laughs> it wants it as sandy as can be. So. You know, with some of those areas, we even have to go really light on the mulch. Yep. So. So Terry asks, would you pull up the patch of flower volunteers in your lawn and move it to a fence or trellis area? I would. That's a good question because every spring I have them in my backyard. It pops up all over the place in the turf grass. Mm -hmm. And I have just in, in that part of the backyard is Bahia. Generally the vast majority of it is Bahia with some weeds, you know, kind of thin Bahia. Um, and I can go along with the shovel and dig them up. If the, the little volunteers are large enough, 
you can dig up um, a good, as big of a chunk of soil around it as you can and transplant it. I have taken them to our Master Garden Nursery before and they got successful plants out of it. Not everyone will survive, but a lot of them will. It's a good That's way to go. Go. They were free. So what have you lost? Nothing, you know, go ahead and try it. You might want to try put them in a pot at first, but mm -hmm. you know, I would probably skip the pot step too and just say, let's see if you're going to work on, on this fence. If you're not, you did, you, you, you lost nothing. You know? <laughs> so. And with the bee question, Monica suggests get some red sage. The bees love the flowers and so do hummingbirds, try zinnias. Both of those plants are covered with bees, very attractive to bees. That's true. Uh, tropical sage, the one that gets the red flowers, mm -hmm. really all the different sages and all the different flowering um, native plants. Uh, firebush, firebush is great for bees and hummingbirds, butterflies. Everybody loves that. And I know up there in Chinsigat, I'm sure she has growing as a weed, the um, hitchhiker, you know, Biden's alba with a little white, you know, daisy looking flowers that a lot of people consider a nuisance. But if it's not an area where those stickers are going to get on you, let some of it grow. If I ever want a picture of any kind of, you know, some kind of pollinator on um, a flower, all I do is walk out to my patch of that and they're going to be there. Mm -hmm. So that'll attract them too. I mean, it's a weed and it can be aggravating, but oh boy, the pollinators sure love it. It's a very important pollen and nectar source late in the season here for bees and a lot of other insects. And Carol points out that there is a native wild plumbago that is more of a ground cover than a flowering bush. That is very And she even shared a link on here, too. So, Just like the uh, native porter weed is more of a trailing type plant than the, uh -huh. uh, the upright non-native one. And we have the native pine lands lantana which looks similar to the big box store lantanas, but it's a native and it grows slower and lower. Generally, it's kind of more of a ground covery type plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for all these different things, if you could find a native equivalent, native plants are great because they're so low maintenance. You kind of set them and forget them, plant mm -hmm. them, water them until they get established. But then after that, you're not out there having to fight insects and fight everything to keep them alive. They tend to do really, so really well. Reduce your around. carbon footprint if you have native plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if you are a lazy gardener like myself, it's uh -huh. definitely a very good option. Yep. yep. Um, I have a class on Hernando County Government YouTube. If you go to there and look under my playlist, Florida Family Landscaping. There's one particular class called This, Not That, and that's exactly what it does. It um, comes up with, it's some of them common or some of them um, rather invasive non-natives, you know, that people like, but here's your native alternative that is very similar to that. So that's might be somewhere you wanna, you know, look and check that out. Also, you had mentioned a whole list of insects <clears throat> a little bit ago, which are all going to be highlighted next Wednesday, <laughs> September 22nd at 10 a.m. If you go to my Facebook page, it will be recorded if you can't catch it. Dr. Lester and I will be covering favorite plants of Florida pest insects. <laughs> so... <laughs> kind of a different slant on things, so. And if you want any information about any of the classes that I give, Lily gives, both of us give, anybody else in our office gives, if you follow us on Facebook, and our short Facebook name is Hernando EXT, or go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, you're gonna find a full listing of all of our upcoming classes, all the links, the information, and the nice thing is, 
pretty much all of them, definitely the ones that Lily and I do, get recorded and saved in one way or another. So even if you're not free at that day and time, don't think that you're, you know, totally lost, missed all the information. If you shoot us an email, get in contact with us, when we turn it into a video and get it on YouTube or Facebook or wherever it may be, we can share that link with you so that you can still see it. Yep, we have lots of things, lots of classes out there you can learn. You can learn from. You know, I was just thinking maybe next week we should share some of those um, emails that uh, came to that area extension office, not yours, that we shared with your master gardener trainees um, the other night. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll pull that list up and go through a couple of those scenarios. Sure, yeah. Because I found that that's a really good way to um, teach master gardeners, give an actual scenario, something that you could you could encounter in real life, and then just kind of um, discuss where do you start, what kind of questions should you ask, should you immediately start with running to your garage and grabbing that bottle of spray your grandfather left, of some product that's been off the market for 20 years probably not you probably don't want to start there we can give you an idea of where to start and it's great for homeowners too it gives you just a way of looking at lawn and garden problems to figure out what's my first step second step third step how do i figure this out so i solve the problem and get the result that i want which reminds me of another upcoming class. I don't remember the date, but we're going to be climbing the uh, IPM pyramid, oh. integrated pest management. So we've got lots of good things coming up. Okay, Lily, the Hernando County government YouTube that you put in the comments, that was for the this, not that list. Yep. Oh, and I did it. I got stuff popping up all over here. When I write, it comes up as you. <laughs> I could get yes, you. Yes, it does, and it confuses me too. It could get you in a lot of trouble too. <laughs> okay, it's about that time, but let's squeeze in one more question here from Ken. When can I mow a large area of passion flower in pasture every year without killing butterflies? You're not going to kill the butterflies. They're going to move out of the way of the sound of the mower, for one thing. But if you're worried about what they're coming to eat, um, it depends, you know. Uh, if you're worried about killing caterpillars that are feeding on it, yeah, you want to cut. If you want to only cut it once a year, you should do a very early spring because that gives butterflies and caterpillars all the rest of the summer to still come. And the adults are going to lay eggs. The caterpillars are going to feed on the leaves. Yeah. And they, I know Gulf fritillaries do it all summer long. Right. And if he's worried about the, the caterpillars, um, like you said, early, what are you talking about? Like February, you think? They start popping up in February. They pop up in my backyard February-ish. But if you want to mow a large area, be, to cut back the old dead vines from the previous year, Late winter, February, in Central Florida, February ish. Because yeah. yeah. then what's going to happen is after you cut them back, they will grow back. They'll get new fresh leaves. That's even better for caterpillars. So if your goal is to cut back the old, dead, maybe big tangle of vines, late winter, I would think would be the best time of year to do that. They do like to uh, grow in pastures. I've seen them you know, grow like all over pastures. It's great if you are not using that pasture you know, for something else. And they grow in wooded areas as long as it's not too heavily wooded and it's at least partly sunny. Mm -hmm. Up there at Chinsegat, they got it popping up all over the place in the the lightly wooded area, right. the heavily right. wooded areas, not so much. And I always, I never remember which one of the butterflies, one of them prefers the shadier spots of the passion vine and the other one likes the sunnier spots. The gull, I think it's the they gulf both need a mine, But the gulf fritillaries come out earlier, zebra okay. longwings come out later. 
So now I have all the zebra long wings flying around. Cool. And not so many of the Gulf fertile areas. Pretty neat. Yes, it is still a good time of year for butterflies. You just have to kind of follow the butterfly seasons, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will be back here again next Thursday. I have absolutely no idea what's going on at the moment. Let me glance. Yeah, I'll be here next Thursday. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I guess you'll be there too. So yeah. mm -hmm. it's still September, so I'll be around. October, you might not see me a whole lot. <laughs> but. Okay, we'll have to work that out. I'll have to get some other guests in here. So, mm -hmm. or if worse comes to worse, I'll do it by myself. Okay. Yeah. I have no, uh, you know, no worries about that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, everybody. And thank you for so many different questions on so many different topics. Um, we will see you again next week. And thank you so much to the people who may be new to watching us and new to asking questions. I saw a couple of new names up there today. So that's always great. And until next week, we'll see you then. Thanks. Bye. Right, thank you.